<laughs> Welcome to another episode of oh, Powerhead Beat <laughs> Radio, where John takes it and the crew take a deep dive into all the strange little bitty kind of nugget sayings that we've pulled from nutrition from over the years. That's right. We welcome our nutrition ninjas, Rob and Sam. How are we doing, guys? Great. Good. How are you? All right. And they empower their nutrition clients one-on-one -on -one and often to take this complex thing that is nutrition and sticking to your diet, having stick to and leaning Stop. on. Wait, wait. Did you just make a word up? stick to You never heard that? Oh, I'm going to go high, to the, uh, high the school, audience high, here. High school think, football coach it's a 101. Thing. Making words. Oh, oh uh, okay. Okay. Then I, your I, athletes I, steal them and use them in real life as if they exist. That kind of reminds me of Kelly Starrett's Unscared. And then Brian McKenzie went and got it on his knuckles. Uh, well, and I then, don't know how to spell stick to it. And then so the I'm not going to get the tattoo. Best part was we're say. like, that's not a real word. And the look on his face when he realized that that wasn't a real word and Starrett just made it up. He like dropped and then like the next day came back and he's like, oh, my mission in life is to make this a word. No, it's not. Now that's what I call stick to itiveness. Or having <laughs> no regrets. <laughs> no regrets. <laughs> that's still my favorite tattoo. No regrets. <laughs> and no, and Be careful. Yeah, I think it's like a Snickers commercial. No, no regrets. No, no, it was in. Um, it was the movie with uh, uh, Jennifer Anderson and the dude who's. Um, we're the Millers. Yeah, we're the Millers. It's a great movie. It is. Anyway. <laughs> so what's great is when we're, we're already when, derailed when, when 60 we, seconds in. When we were coming up with some ideas for a nutrition podcast, one of the ones that was pitched that Sam and Rob put together is the backstory on where we came or where I or we or the royal we came up with a lot of these little taglines for nutrition. So well, the the weight that I was alluding to and getting to is it helps the layman lean on and remember I can do this. So let's introduce one by one and, okay. and it's broken down by macros, John. Ooh. If you'd like to introduce them, well, no, you go. We'll you're, you're looking at the computer. I can't remember them all. You can't remember them all. No. Why well, I've memorized this lecture <laughs> given many a times. You want to talk uh, about uh, selling yourself and BDE? Me giving a nutrition lecture. <laughs> <laughs> I, that is as inauthentic as I've ever felt. Uh, well, the, the, it was organized in macros, and we always let off with everyone's favorite protein. Protein. And we went into the tagline: if it's got a face, a mother, or a soul. No, yeah, a face, a soul, or a mother. If it runs, if it flies, it swims. It's a protein. Mm -hmm. And we broke down the the different proteins. So let's well, let's talk about the origin of that line. Uh, so the the. The face, a soul, and a mother was simple because I kept getting people talking to me all the time about how there was some special macro or some ratio of bean to rice that had a complete amino profile and that you didn't have to eat meat. You could just do this magical ratio of beans and rice. And uh, that's where that piece came from, where I just had to delineate that the only real proteins and the only ones we count are ones with faces, souls, and a mother. And I threw the faces and souls and mother out there as a kind of an homage F you to the vegans and the uh, dirt worshiping hippies that were upset by the fact that we eat these animals. Mm. 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 So you got to remember it was a kind, it was a not nearly as kind and gentle a world 10 plus years ago when I got into this. Uh, I feel like we've watered so many things down to try to avoid hurting people's feelings and upsetting people because when I was raised, Sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never hurt me. In today's age, words are weapons because we've talked about stress as being extremely damaging to individuals. And if your words cause stress to me, then effectively the stress of the words is hurting me. And now these words are weapons and potentially are ending my life. Which absolutely fucking blows my mind that in the last 20 years, 30 years, we went from sticks and stones, my break my bones and names will never hurt me to your words are weapons because they cause me stress. And we have created this idea that stress is a bad thing. We know it's not. You got to stress to progress. You know, I mean, think about lifting weights. I mean, what's the greatest form of stress? You're stressing the, the organism and the system to try to create adaptations like muscle and strength and all the other stuff. So without stress, we don't progress as organisms unless... Or a bunch of kids who have grown up in a society where stress is something considered to be bad. And we also don't grow physically without protein. 
for sure. Uh, I, let me tell you about your awkward transitions. I'm trying <laughs> to Jimmy. allow our nutrition ninjas to. Well, you can always say, "Hey, Rob, Sam, well, what do you guys think?" I, I think um, you know, really, that whole you know, face and a soul and all that, and is the fact that you know, really, especially for our purposes, the the uh, animal proteins are just more bio bioavailable. And I think John, you've kind of talked about it on the podcast before is it's just, it's more, um, it's more compact. You're, you're going to get more bang for your buck with it versus like the plant proteins and, and things like that, which are not as bioavailable for, for us as humans or nutrient dense is another way to look at it. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Have to create, um, amino acid profiles. They just have them. Right. So you're not like, Oh, if I do beans and rice, mixed together, it gives me a perfect protein. Protein just is perfect. Yeah. I think, uh, yeah. Like on that same lines that that muscle maven shared this thing about the just egg. Have you seen that thing? Just Um, egg. No, I have not. It is, (laughs) it is, it is a liquid form of supposedly eggs made out of plants. So it's called just eggs, which you take the most perfect protein and then you just fuck it up by making it some sort of plant concoction yeah I basically guess I, like in a, in oh, a tube I, I get what it is i'm just more contemplating liquid, like yeah. how like what's like, like i i have one brief addition so the um during one of my nutrition lectures that i gave this must have been 2015 or 16 i do recall is it crossfit dc when we were hosting and we were talking about uh eggs and yolk, which we'll get into because we're on the protein, Mm -hmm. because we did have an asterisk next to eggs within the protein. Before you get into it, just a quick, uh, funny aside, I asked the group what the yolk was. And one of the answers, it was this young kid, he was like an intern at American University, puts his hand up and just interjects, liquid chicken. (laughs) (laughs) So I had to take 60 seconds to compose myself because I laughed my ass off right in his face. But uh, let's, let's jump to that. John, why did you highlight and put an asterisk in the eggs? What's so important to then uh, share the with uh, students. Uh, if you look at people that have autoimmune issues, um, I think the major contributing factors for autoimmune are, are eggs, uh, which is the technically the biotin in the white. So I think this comes back to um, like the bodybuilding days where people are just consuming massive amounts of egg whites, not realizing that the majority of what we were looking for in terms of like DHA and fats and all the other cool jiggy stuff was in the yolk. Um, the autoimmune condition, usually if somebody has some form of autoimmune, the first thing you do is you pull out peanuts, uh, you know, wheat, rye, soy, uh, you know, it'd be gluten. And then the other one would be eggs. Those are really the two or three big ones for autoimmune disease. So you look at trying to, you know, prevent and exasperate autoimmune diseases by removing potentially gut irritants. And there's a huge amount of people that are allergic to them. So eggs are one of those things where I think they're very dose dependent. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think you, if you consume a ton of eggs, like I did for a number of years, all of a sudden you get to a point where maybe you don't digest them the same way. And that's why I think we talk about like uh, rotating foods and kind of cycling them a little bit, maybe not eating like, six to eight to a dozen eggs every single day for 20 years. And then all of a sudden you kind of go through and you do a, um, you know, food tolerance test and all of a sudden eggs is through the roof, which is what happened to me. So I just cut eggs out for 30 days and now I just eat maybe uh, twice a week. I might have eggs and some days I go weeks without having eggs. So I think I overdid it a little bit. That's the John Wellborn way. Yeah. Well, you know what? Like once I find a kind of a, a, like a routine for foods, I just kind of stick with it. And I think, uh, you know, for gut health and especially as you age, I think you become less resilient in terms of like dealing with some of this stuff. Like I said, a, a consult yesterday with Inclodon, there's a really fascinating set of tests. You guys would dig on this, um, this guy, and I forgot who he told me the name of the dude, but the guy's dad developed uh, Parkinson's. And it was like a Parkinson's and Alzheimer's mix. And the guy went through and was like, you know, why, uh, like, why aren't we testing all of these markers earlier? And so Mm -hmm. the guy developed a test for, uh, you know, like basically all these different markers so that he could assess whether or not you were on track for Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, and some of these neurological things. So it just came out about two months ago. And so I tested it probably about six weeks ago, 
got the results and I was going through it with Inklet on. And then the guy has a protocol where you can reduce all these. Mm -hmm. So what's super cool is, uh, you know, we had Joe DeRudy on the podcast who does the hyperbarics. So I got to go meet with a doctor here in Austin on Thursday who has like a medical grade hyperbarics. And Joe was able to plug me in with them and say, Hey, this is the protocol we want to do. And I want John to do this protocol now that we got this neurological testing done. And then I talked to Inklet on and he has a, a protocol, like basically if you're high in this, you do this and this. So he's supposed to send me the protocol. So what I want to do is the eight weeks of hyperbarics and the protocol, and then do a retest at the end and see if I can really reduce a lot of this stuff. So pretty interesting. Uh, but what was wild was like, um, some, some things were, were kind of high and, but for the most part, uh, Tom made a good point where he goes, I thought after, you know, playing in the NFL and the amount of hits and whatnot, I thought you'd be a lot worse, which I'm always like, well, that's good. At least I'm <laughs> not worse. Uh, yeah. but I think, uh, you know, there's a great connection between the gut and the brain and, mm -hmm. uh, all the pain receptors that are in the gut. And they always talk about this gut brain connection. So I think when you talk about mental health in terms of like, uh, mental fitness in terms of Alzheimer's and dementia and avoiding these for a long time. I think it starts in the gut. I think you have to look at it and say, Hey, I'm going to eat a, you know, diverse diet, Roy G. Biv. I'm going to rotate through my proteins. I'm not going to eat the same thing every day. And I'm not going to sit down and eat a dozen eggs, not to say you can't digest them, but I think that there is a benefit in rotating through the foods and like going through and just kind of cycling everything. Like, you know, part of the year we eat more beef, and we, uh, you know, this time we're kind of eating a little more turkey. I still fucking hate chicken. Uh, at certain points we eat fish and I kind of cycle through this. And it's really just trying to rotate through the proteins and also rotate through other things. So Sam and Rob, when you're encouraging your clients, flesh builds flesh, meat, fish, fowl, seafood, eggs. How do you go about rotating so they don't get sick of it as well as getting the benefits of uh, cycling your meats? Yeah. Um, just offering different suggestions. I know, uh, we post or I post several recipes to the blog, but if you're my client, I give you more, um, just quick guidelines on like how to cycle it. So, you know, one day might be an egg sandwich. The next might be overnight oats with whey protein and collagen. The next day might be a Greek yogurt of some sort. So like breakfast right there, there's three ways to get three different protein sources. Um, and then the same with uh, like meal prep. I always recommend you meal prep, maybe just like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and then you make fresh on Wednesday and then you have Thursday, Friday and pick different proteins for like your lunches or leftovers um, that way. So, you know, if Monday is ground beef, then make or Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday is ground beef, then make Thursday, Friday, like ground turkey or something um, mixed with your veggies and rice or sweet potatoes. Um, just keep it super simple, but that way you're always rotating. Um, and then we check their food logs. Um, pretty much all of our clients do meal track. We start off, I'd say, you know, Hey, track for four weeks and give us a baseline. And then a lot of people just enjoy tracking and continue on as they work with us. So if we see the same foods, that's something I bring to my client's attention. Like, Hey, you're super consistent on your macros, but let's like lay off of the eggs or whatever it might be and pick something else. <laughs> the, uh, the one that got me was, um, you know, uh, I was real like hard on peanut butter because mm. peanut butter is not a nut. It's a uh, legume legume. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of gut irritants associated with legume and phytoestrogens and there was plant-based lectins that were similar to gluten and legumes. So I talked about, you know, Hey, if you're going to have them, make sure you're soaking the beans ahead of time. And, you know, like, don't crush a ton of beans. Like if you want to go out and have some beans and rice or, you know, black beans or whatnot, like just be smart. And I always talked about, you know, avoiding peanut butter because there's a peanut allergy is by far the biggest allergy in this country. Um, so I always talked, uh, always recommended, or I still always recommend almond butter or finding other nut butters. Uh, when I got my food allergy testing, I was allergic to shit to almonds. Uh, like all these nuts I had like real high allergy, no reaction to peanut butter. <laughs> and uh so at that point i was like peanut butter is back in <laughs> peanut butter's back <laughs> and the kids what, what, it's pretty funny I, I sold myself for about a decade plus maybe longer that almond butter was better than peanut butter you know like shampoo is better you know like i was like uh, happy gilmore or um no it's billy madison <laughs> arguing between shampoo and conditioner 
the same thing, I'd be like, oh, peanut butter sucks. I can't believe people choose peanut oh butter. Oh my, I love it. So much better. Guilty pleasure. I, I like, I'll go in and uh, um, so like this morning I had, um, I, like that's my deal. Like I, we went to Costco on Sunday. We had people, we had Harry Shaw and uh, come over. So I, I cooked some steaks and I've been eating them for breakfast for the last two days. So I had that. I have this uh, gluten-free toast that Kate got for the kids, which I totally steal. Put two of that in, put peanut butter on it. And I'm like, God damn it, this is so good. I can't believe I lied to myself for all these decades. Big fan of an Elvis burger. I'm sure we'll get to Don't Be Weird. Uh, is that a peanut butter banana uh, cheeseburger? Basically, it's peanut butter and anything on a burger. And then usually, depending if I'm in Oklahoma City or Nashville or Memphis, somewhere along, along that line in the country, there's some variation of an Elvis burger. I don't think I've ever seen that. And then do you, what do you drink with that? A Dr. Pepper? It's 12 beers. I don't know. <laughs> Whatever's there in front of me. Uh, but let's, we'll save the don't be weird for the end. Uh, moving from our flesh builds fre- f- flesh, excuse me, fresh protein, builds flesh. Eat with abandon. Uh, yeah. Any, any comment on eat with abandon? Uh, yeah. The eat with abandon stemmed from uh, like, so early on, uh, I was like a lot of what you, uh, like a lot of what's layered in here was kind of rage against the zone is what I used to call it. Uh, you may get rage against the machine. I was raging against the zone and all of this like stupid zone stuff. Mm-hmm. And what I, what was amazing with CrossFit in the zone was how they were under prescribing people on these foods. It's like, Hey, you're going to need seven zone blocks a day. And you're like, Holy shit, that's nothing. So, uh, when, of course I'm going to lose weight. <laughs> yeah. I mean, fuck you're like in starvation. Starving. Mode. So what was kind of bugging me a little bit is if you look at any of the protein refeeding studies, it's pretty fascinating. Like they've gone in and figured, you know, basal metabolic rates and they fed people pretty consistent to try to like, Hey, this is exactly how many calories you need. They've weighed them and they put them in like a a trial. And then they did protein refeeding where they started feeding them like 10, 20 and 30% more protein up into calories. And not a single person gained a pound of fat. And when they went and did body comps, only muscle went up. So Mm -hmm. you don't really get fat from overeating on protein. So because these people were so regimented on the zone diet, I, uh, you know, and the fact that people kept asking me for like macros and this, and I remember telling them like, it's really hard to overeat on protein. Like I've tried, I've sat down and, uh, you know, like a 40 ounce steak, like I can hammer that pretty well. I couldn't give you four meals a day, a 40 ounce steak. Now I'd love to try. It's kind of like Thanksgiving, right? Like, you know, if you're smart, you just try to eat as much turkey as you can on the front side and then just try to backfill with whatever's on the table. That's that's always been my plan. And that's what I always recommend to my clients on Thanksgiving because Thanksgiving was always a huge pain point. Thanksgiving's coming up. What do I do? Here's here's your deal. I want you to eat all of the turkey with reckless abandon, white meat, dark meat, leg, whatever you get, reckless abandon. I want you to go crazy and stuff yourself with turkey. And then after you've stuffed yourself with turkey, then I want you to try to eat whatever else is left. And uh, the, I remember I had one guy and he's like, dude, I crushed the turkey. I like, took like one bite of stuffing and like the tryptophan got me and it was like a ninja blow dart. And I didn't even wake up for cake or for, uh, for pie. And uh, yeah. I thought that was a pretty good technique. So that's where the reckless abandon came from. I want you to eat your proteins with reckless abandon. And then if you're trying to, you know, be in another situation, backfill with all the other good stuff. And uh, I found it's really hard to overeat on carbohydrates when you eat with reckless abandon on the protein side. Mm -hmm. So it was just a strategy to get people to eat more protein. And, um, you know, the other one that kind of was been pretty interesting, and this was, I I, I guess I was even in this a little bit where uh, I had this idea that carbs, like there was no essential carbohydrate. There's only essential fats. Proteins are essential for muscle and really the carbohydrates dependent upon energy expenditure. Um, that's a pretty interesting, and I think I've pivoted a little away from that now where, you know, for the Krebs cycle and the put on muscle, and, uh, this came from actually a bunch of studies where they looked at low carb diets and ketogenic diets. It's really hard to put on new muscle without some form of carbohydrate in the mix. Uh, even all the low carb ketogenic stuff, people lost fat. They didn't lose muscle, but they were very, very difficult environments to put on muscle. So for people that are like, I just need to lose weight. And I don't care if I put on muscle, ketogenic, low carb diets do great. If you're a young individual is trying to kick the door off the hinges, you need carbs. Um, side note, um, 
I'm in this group on Facebook uh, that's called Type 1 Grit. It's a Facebook page for uh, kids with type 1 diabetes and it has parents in there, which is really the downfall of it. Uh, but one of the parents was in there, and this was a mom, talking about her 19 or 20-year-old son who was 6'3", 175 pounds, started lifting weights and can't put on weight. And she was like asking for help. And as I was going through and reading all the comments of all these moms who have one, never lifted weights, <laughs> two, never been an 18, 19 year old boy, and three, never really have eaten with reckless abandon, the dietary restrictions and their like sleuthing for this, like made me just shut my computer and go to bed. And I realized how uneducated people are in terms of like muscle growth and size. Like my first question would be like, what's he doing for his training? You have him on a low carb diet. Why? Why are you carb fears? I mean, he doesn't have type one diabetes. He probably has good insulin sensitivity due to age. He probably doesn't carry a lot of extraneous body fat. So he doesn't have an oxidative state and like all these things, but listening to these moms all want to talk about, uh, one lifting weights, two muscle. Like it was, it, it just makes me realize that even when you have no fucking idea because you're on the internet, you feel that you're entitled to contribute to shit. Yeah. And, um, it's always gone back to this idea of like, just because you can have an opinion doesn't mean that everybody's opinion has the same weight. Like, uh, is that a pun intended? No, it's not. It, it, it's there, there is no pun, but it's like, just like, I, I think everybody's, you know, Hey, like everybody's entitled to their opinion. The internet has proved that everybody has one. I just don't think that everybody's opinion should weigh the same. I'm not going to listen to some 40 year old mom. Who's one never lifted weights, never been an 18 to 20 year old boy and never fucking actually ever tried to put on muscle about how to do these things. And it's yeah. amazing that these women would chime in and one really skinny dude that run triathlons chimed in that they would chime in and be like, this is so far outside my fucking wheelhouse. You probably need to find a big Jack dude who knows what the fuck he's talking about. And, uh, you know, and what's so like, sorry to fucking deviate no. off, but, uh, like that piece of like knowing your wheelhouse, what do you do? And then finding people that can help you get there. You know, I mean, that's uh, been a great kind of piece for us. So, yeah. And that's like, sorry to gem, oh, gem yeah. in, but that battle, the bullshit, like there are so, especially in this industry, when it comes to nutrition, fitness, everyone has an opinion. Um, but keeping in mind that what worked for this 19 year old kid or whatever doesn't work for me as a almost 30 year old female with two kids, right? Like everything for me is going to look different than you or Tex or Rob. Um, so it's not a one size fits all, which is why shameless plug having a coach is, is great. I think like all of us have, you know, a network that we bounce ideas off of like, Hey, do you think this will work for me? What do you think about this macro split, this training program for this goal? Will you help write a program? Like it's finding the right resources because it's so individualized. Um, I mean, there are things if you starve yourself and restrict calories, sure, you'll lose weight. Like there are like laws that will just work. But for the most part, it's pretty individualized and it's cyclical. Um, yeah, it's just there's so much on the Internet that could I could go on for an hour about that. <laughs> well, the, well, the one I enjoy, too, especially for women is uh, I always think whenever I see any of these prescriptions for women, they're always under prescribing protein. Yeah, always. I mean, always. always. Um, yeah. Well, we I will mean, get to how much. Oh, okay. Oh. Yeah. It's, We're still on what to eat. Rob, you had a, a point to add? Well, I was going to um, kind of talk a little bit about this, something that Sam and I were talking about the other day. Is just, I think the, you know, the problem with the internet is that it gives um, people unrealistic expectations about how long some of this stuff takes mm -hmm. and that, um, you know, they want it now and yesterday and that six weeks and four weeks or whatever. And, and the reality is, you know, you kind of look at things. It is, it is such a long process and like just, you know, kind of, for instance, I, I recently went to my 35th high school class reunion and, and I grew up in a small town and, you know, people that stay in a small town uh, look a lot different than I do. And so, you know, when, you know, I had this conversation with several people is like, you know, I basically started, you know, doing this, you know, 25, 30 years ago, and I just never stopped. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that, and, and along the way, you just make little tweaks here and there to get to where you are. And most people want this. I want it yesterday kind of thing. And I think the internet has certainly fed that. So that's what I want to say. Yeah, no. And 
this again segue from Rob. Um, Tex, I was actually talking to Coach Joe about this um, over the weekend and women, just bringing it back to women. So those lady listeners out there, they uh, a lot of them come up to me and they're like, uh, hey, what do you do? You know, I'm like, I lift heavy weights, right? Like, here's power athlete. Like, let me say work. <laughs> it doesn't. And they're like, well, I don't want to get bulky. And I'm like, well, do you think I look bulky? Also, I'm trying to gain muscle mass right now. So like, please say yes. No. Um, but they're like, well, no, I just really like, you know, your arms or whatever that like compliment they give me, but then you get them in the gym and they are picking up five pound dumbbells, you know, or going to the cardio machine. Um, so it's just like people take what they want from the conversation, which is normally like nothing. Um, but you have to put in the work and you can start now but you have to put in the work nutrition and fitness wise if you want to see like quicker results like rob was saying uh same thing happens to my wife people stop her everywhere and like ask her these training questions and she tells them the exact same thing and they're always like no that'll never work and you're like <laughs> there's visual evidence right there yeah. in front of you and, and, and <laughs> or, or, or they somehow think that they're that she's lying to them and i'm like i mean everywhere we go somebody stops kate and asks her like like, what do you do for your arms? How, you know, on this? And she's like, uh, I bang heavy weights four days a week and I do aerobic work. And she kind of goes through this whole thing. Like, uh, you know, we have a, a assault bike at the house. We put a treadmill in the house and I'll take the dogs on a walk. So they're like, so wait a minute, you weigh and measure all your food. You lift weights heavy four days a week. And then you just do some like low endurance conditioning. She's like, yeah, that'll never work. And then like, they, they, they get upset and think that she lied to them. And um, she's like, ah. I've been there when she's told people we were at a bar and she was telling these women and these women were like, just shaking their heads like, no, 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 that can't work. That'll make me big and bulky. And she's just like, uh, I've, been okay. to get big and bulky. Oh, yeah. like, I've been trying it. Oh, and then my favorite is women that are like, oh, if I touch a weight, I'll just get, I'll, I'll look like Arnold Schwarzenegger. And I'm like, <laughs> I don't know. I've been trying for years. And uh, unfortunately, I know that's not true. So um, if you, but you could be the one, you could be the Neo <laughs> of this motherfucker. <laughs> I, uh, this is way off, but I went out for the first time in probably two years with a group of girls the other day. And this girl told me that she's like, yeah, I have like a $4,000 home gym. I'm like, that's cool. Me too. No. Um, but she was like, yeah, I smoke weed. And then I lift weights. And I was like, and she's like, Arnold Schwarzenegger did it. And I'm like, okay. Yeah, he also has a handful of Diana Ball, So, I mean, yeah, you know. I'm like, uh, the, uh, anyway. I, I actually had a good talk about, um, about this yesterday with Inkladon. Uh, we were talking about uh, like marijuana and like kind of like performance and, and um, you know, opiates and the whole deal. And his comment was pretty interesting in that, uh, well, on, on two fronts, uh, you know, he, he uh, for those of you guys who don't know, he does a lot of cancer uh, research and works with a lot of people that have kind of stage four kind of gnarly cancers. And uh, I asked him one time about the CBD stuff and he's like, oh, he's like, dude, do you want any? I have boxes of CBD that, uh, the, the, you know, that the people have come in that I've treated, uh, after they pass away, the families will give me boxes of all these different CBDs that they were taking, trying to cure their cancer with the CBD. Do you want to try it? Have everyone. I kind of got kind of quiet and I'm like, so what you're saying, none of it works. He's like, no, he goes, I haven't, he goes, we've tested markers and looked and we've had people take every CBD on the planet and I haven't seen adjust any of the markers. And mm -hmm. I was like, oh shit. So that one was pretty wild. And then I was talking about marijuana in terms of performance. And he goes, well, I'll just tell you this. He goes, the amount of clients and ex-athletes that I work with who are big marijuana smokers, the amount of erectile dysfunction that they have is through the roof. He goes, uh, he goes, I find myself, that's like one of the biggest things I'm prescribing or we're prescribing working through. And it's one of the biggest complaints where guys are like, yeah, no, I smoke weed a couple of times a day. And they come in and they get erectile dysfunction deal. And so he's like, you know, that we hand out this stuff. Like he goes, that's one of the biggest things we prescribe for guys. And he goes, what's amazing is the estrogens through the roof. The testosterone is, is having issues. And he goes, not a single one of them has a healthy androgen profile that regularly does it. So um, the other one, and we, then we were wrapping a little bit about Dr. Amen just came out with an interesting study where they looked at blood flow as it relates to marijuana. And uh, they were having people, I think smoke, and then they were putting them into CAT scans and neuro scans and the whole deal. And they saw decreased blood flow into key areas where you don't want decreased blood flow. Mm -hmm. So Amen's stance was like, based upon this piece of research, we're not necessarily going to recommend that, you know, this is something that will fight off Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. So, but I mean, they, they also saw decreased blood flow with, uh, with opiates too. So, 
you know, I mean, what's better, what's worse. I mean, I got to go with the marijuana and over like the opiate addiction, but you know, there's also some other issues for guys, especially as you age, you know, too much marijuana, you're going to run into some erectile dysfunction issues. Speaking of erectile dysfunction, <laughs> limiting your carbs. I don't know this from experience, just off what Luke used to say during his, uh, his hardcore CrossFit days and getting into carbohydrates and your one liner, what used to be earn your carbs sounds like it's evolved a little bit. Mm -hmm. And for many of the people that were attending, this was, this was new, some old John, can you introduce the three energy systems and where earn your carbs plays into eating vegetables, roots, tubers, and bulbs. Uh, yeah, we, uh, well, obviously your short energy system is called your ATP system, uh, which would be, you know, anywhere from zero to probably 29, 28, 30 seconds. And then anything in that mid length is going to be called your glycolytic energy system, which is going to push you out a little bit farther, which is really where you would think about CrossFit and high intensity exercises really in that glycolytic phase. And then that autonomic, uh, aerobic phase, uh, which is probably going to look like anything you do outside of that glycolytic, which could be anything from like walking or even an autonomic phase or autonomic phase of us sitting here, heart breathing, uh, you know, body functions that we aren't necessarily controlling or in that aerobic deal. So what's, what really happened, I think with the CrossFit and what they tapped into was that like big hit glycolytic phase and that big glycolytic capacity engine, which is really predicated on, uh, carbohydrates and glycogen. So uh, anybody that's ever got into glycogen depletion and really just emptied the liver and that's where, you know, carbohydrates are stored or uh, converted into glycogen and it's pushed out into the muscles. But when you really get into that, like uh, big glycogen depletion, which we tried, I mean, we went low carb, did a bunch of CrossFit high intensity exercise. And all of a sudden that got like glyc glycogen depletion phase is fucking no bueno. And it's not a fun place to be. So uh, if you are doing some form of high intensity exercise, something that looks like CrossFit conditioning or really any of the power athlete programs that have a little bit of, you know, glycolytic conditioning, whether it be supersets or, you know, uh, D wads, if you're following Johnny Watt or doing any of that stuff, you're going to need some carbohydrates in the system. You can do it on a low carb diet. You're just going to have to go at a reduced pace. Well, introducing vegetables. Is that a challenge for clients? It can be. Do, do people, I mean, uh, uh, it, it's interesting with all the different variations of vegetables, it's pretty amazing that people get stuck on like broccoli, asparagus, kale and kale, tomatoes, tomatoes. I'm mm -hmm. just speaking from experience. Oh, so those are the ones, I mean, like we constantly, like, I, I really take the Roy G Biv thing to, uh, um, to an extreme when we walk in, you know, let's say you, like, I, I, I hate going to whole foods, but we went there last week for lunch every day because it was quick <laughs> and you know, like it just worked. And when you walk in. I made a joke in the nutrition talk. I'm like, when we walk into Whole Foods, uh, the way it's designed is all that cut fruit is right there to suck in like the, uh, uh, like the, the feeble minded and just like the, the drones. And sure <laughs> enough, we walk in and fucking Dex, uh, Nick and Xanis just instantly all make a right turn and go right to the pre-cut fruit and walk. And I was like, see, fucking, there you go. Worker bee. nice to get in there drone. But like, that's why they design it because we're so designed to see those pretty colors. And when you mm -hmm. see them, it's like, all right. But when you see that cut stuff in there, you just are like, you know, watermelon. And then Tex was trying to give me, what was it? You were doing it for your heart? For my heart. Yeah. He's over the there eating. Ticker. <laughs> I'm like, I don't know what piece of research you found where it talked about consuming watermelon for uh, uh, coronary health, but I like it. And then, uh, but I, whenever we go in there, uh, I always like to tell the kids, I'm like, Hey, what's the most vi vibrant fruit or vibrant, um, you know, vegetable that you see? And I'll let them go pick the weirdest thing and then I'll buy it and I'll cook it for them. Uh, you know, I, I love Japanese sweet potatoes, anything that's purple, anything that's dark and um, try to cook that. Watermelon is rich in an amino acid called Arginine, citrulline, right? yeah. citrulline that help, may help move blood through the body and can lower your blood pressure. That's it. Yeah, that's <laughs> there, there's one study on that. <laughs> it's, and it tastes delicious. <laughs> yeah. And then I'm fine with that, but, uh, trying to like, like, how do you convince your clients to, to like eat with diversity? You know, we talk about eat with abandon, but be creative and really push them out. Is it like, Hey, I want you to go get this. Or do you just tell them to find creatively cool, colored, different things? The creatively cool, colored, different things. Um, 
sometimes I'll do a spreadsheet. I mean, in the, the cheat sheet that we have on our protocols is really helpful because it's right there in their face. It's color coded. It's easy to, to reference. Um, but again, if you're tracking what you're eating, you can be like, I had broccoli, asparagus, salad mix or whatever. Um, and then you're like, oh, maybe I should chop up some red onions or grab some cherry tomatoes. Uh, and just making it super like easy. You laugh at the pick and prep stuff, but that's actually a good selling point for clients. Like it doesn't have to be challenging to, to eat fruits and vegetables. They cut it for you at the grocery store. I, our local grocery store will actually, if you bring them like a squash, they'll like prep it for you. Like, Hey, I want this one. They'll like cut it. And it's not even a bougie whole foods or anything. It's a local small town grocery store. Um, and then eating with the season. So fingers crossed, I get um, the recipes out to y'all, but I'm coming up with like spaghetti squash, acorn squash, um, butternut squash, just like eating with the season um, can is an easy way. Great name of a blog, Sam. Write that down. Uh, Write I've been, um, because of Cashy's, uh, you know, uh, type one diabetes, finding things that we can simulate as carb that don't really have carb in them. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm just telling you cauliflower rice, is a complete good. fucking aropa dope. It's what? not I like, like rice. I know. It doesn't it's, taste like rice. It doesn't taste like rice. It's a filler. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, no. I'm I'm uh, we are completely in agreement. I had a client, I don't know how she did it. I think she roasted it and seasoned it with Mexican seasoning and then she used that instead of tortilla chips and threw like fajita meat on top of it. Mm. it looked good. I have no idea how it tasted. She said she enjoyed it, but so we bought it like so i've done it a couple different ways we we got it in these bags and what i do yeah. is i throw it in the pot with a little bit of water and i actually let the water like completely start to boil and cook down so there's no water left in it and then the only thing left and then i would season it that was pretty awful the other way i did is i bought a head and i did the same thing where i roasted it seized it and then i threw it in the food processor and chopped it up real fine that was actually better and trying to like convince them that it was rice and uh, the funny part was, yeah, like I was trying to convince the kids like, oh, I got this new rice for you. <laughs> and like the problem is, is Cashy's like, I don't think this tastes like rice. And then my daughter is like, this isn't rice. He's totally lying to us. I know exactly what you're doing. You did this. I'm like, shut up. I'm trying to convince him. But yeah, she's uh, uh, feels like um, I call her uh, uh, like the Dukes of Hazard. I'm like, right in the wrongs. She's I'm like Bo and Luke Duke. Got to try to write straight pulling oh, everything boys. out yeah talk shit at all times but yeah that uh, that cauliflower rice they need to call it something else because when you go in thinking it tastes like rice and you're like this doesn't taste like rice why can't they just call it chopped chopped uh cauliflower i mean because that's really i'm not gonna is. buy chopped cauliflower <laughs> i will buy cauliflower rice uh yeah like i feel like that's like one of those uh what the vegans have done real well <laughs> is they've effectively like a rope dope this on this stuff like the ultimate burger no it's not the ultimate burger it's fake meat just Goop. call it the fake the fake pretend fantasy land Goop. um fucking disgusting meat lab created thing that is in a patty cylinder shape like just there's no fucking way and then the other one is is like they have like fake hot dogs now that's my other like vegan hot dogs. They're not fucking hot dogs. Like it's just, I, I don't know. It, Why it, do you, whatever happened to just like veggie burger, like just call it what it is. Yeah. Veggie patty. Yeah. Veggie patty. I mean, yeah. that could be good every once in a while. I don't know. Not uh, really, but I no, mean. I, uh, <laughs> we tried to, I, I, I have had veggie burgers. The only problem is there was more calorie in the veggie burger than there was in the meat burger. Yeah. That's another one. You're like, and just for inflammatory response because they're they're shoved with beans and i don't know yeah and crap no, it's no. like when we uh uh decided to try pea protein <laughs> and uh that almost killed me like i was like i've never been so sick in my life tex on the other hand big fan protein. of free protein <laughs> <laughs> hey what kind of protein do you like whatever's free yeah me uh anything that causes Less me gi damn. distress i won't have it kate's like oh you, you haven't eaten any more of this pea protein i'm like because i'm not that stuff can go fuck itself. <laughs> yeah. Bigger the tub. Fuck you, James suffer. Cameron, and your pea protein <laughs> nonsense. Trying to think of an awkward transition for our next macronutrient. Um, what's a James Cameron movie? Titanic. Titanic. Like you well, tanking right at this moment? Speaking of the Titanic lies that we've been told in the 90s on fats, let's get into it.
Oh, okay. 19, this started in 1959. Ansel Keys did something called the seven country study where they looked at uh, heart disease. He found the major contributor to heart disease was triglycerides, triglycerides being influenced by highs, a high amount of carbohydrates. So, uh, there was this idea that, uh, triglycerides were tied to saturated fat and which had a relationship with heart disease. We found a couple of years ago that the sugar lobby paid him about $10,000 to vilify fat, saturated fat, and not sugar because they were protecting their own. And that is a real actual, that's not a conspiracy theory. That is a real live conspiracy because they actually found the payment. And the more interesting thing is in 1960, about six months after he put out that study, they put out a whole bunch of studies that disproved the seven country study. Unfortunately, Nobody heard that because that's not what they wanted to hear. And then we got into this whole market of statins and creating all of these drugs about creating and lowering uh, dietary or sorry, uh, cholesterol in the system. And the idea that we got to lower cholesterol, these cholesterol is a major player in heart disease and triglycerides are, are dependent upon saturated fat. Mm -hmm. So what they did is they vilified the fat we eat as causing a big thing for heart disease and uh, pretty much created a multi-billion dollar business behind it with all these different saturated drugs. And we found out all it was doing was just making people worse and killing them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's still, and to this day, when you go to the doctor's office, they're still going to talk to you about the evils of saturated fat and this, even though it's been disproven because that was what they were taught in the medical books. And more importantly, in the one day that most doctors went to a nutrition class. Yeah. So, but yet this they're going to sit there. Yeah. Oh, sorry. This might sound like ignorant because I'm by no means all knowing, but doctors don't know everything. <laughs> I well, mean, like they like you to think they do. Yeah. But... Which is the scary part. Um, so if you ever get diagnosed or you get blood work or you get whatever, just like research it yourself. Um, There's like, a reason that I deal that's... with, uh, with a research scientist like Inkladon, who's got a yeah. PhD who actively does research and not a doctor because the doctors don't know how to manipulate this stuff. Um, I'll just give you a case in point. Uh, my dad uh, gets his blood work done. They find out that he's, his testosterone was really low. So what does the doctor do? Gives him testosterone cream, uh, never brings him back to check him. And then after my dad had his third TIA and pretty much we thought he was, you know, about to stroke out, uh, I take him to Tom, we get his blood work done, had zero testosterone in his system. So all the testosterone he was taking was aromatizing to estrogen. Uh, the estrogen was through the roof. It was clotting and he was having TIAs, which were uh, temporal. Uh, basically they're like mini strokes mm -hmm. and he had three of them before we figured this out. And I remember asking him, he was like, well, I was kind of embarrassed. Didn't want to tell anybody I was taking testosterone uh, cream. And pretty much this doctor never brought him back. If he had come back and tested him six weeks later, he would have looked and been like, well, what are you doing? Why, why is there no testosterone in your system? And why is it all aromatizing to estrogen? And at that point, you got to give him something like an arimidex or aromasin to try to block ex estrogen or just take him the fuck off it. So there was a healthy individual that the doctor thought he was going to fix and invariably ended up, you know, almost, uh, you know, putting him in an environment. And then what's wild is after he had that like third uh, TIA, and uh, I think that was kind of the like the straw that broke the camel's back. And then all of a sudden he ends up with, uh, you know, stomach cancer, you know, probably about six months later and uh, was gone two months after that. So, and up into that point had, you know, didn't have the cancer, hadn't had no issues. And so I think a lot of times uh, doctors think they're going to help, but unfortunately they don't have the knowledge to look at the entire picture. So, I mean, yeah. there's a, there's a deal where like, I mean, fuck some 18 year old bodybuilder on some forum knows more about fucking hormone optimization than some doctor who's writing prescriptions because he went to a weekend seminar. And, uh, you know, I did call that doctor and talk to him like, dude, you legitimately, you're, you need to fucking up your game because you just killed an 80 year old man. Mm -hmm. So yeah, just ask questions. But yeah. there's a reason why, uh, like after dealing with doctors in the NFL, I got to the point where I didn't want to deal with doctors. Um, you know, doc Parsley, uh, is like a seventh level wizard in terms of like hormones and knowing a lot of this stuff and like how to fix, because that's what he did for the seal teams. He took a bunch of broken seals and figured out how to optimize those guys and make them better. Uh, Inkladon, same thing, you know, he's done it through, you know, uh, micronutrients and, you know, different protocols and testing and the whole thing in terms of optimizing professional athletes. So I think people that are actually in the fight doing clinical research 
or mm-hmm. dealing with patients that are in going through these things are the guys you just don't want to go to just your local doc and be like, Hey, can I get a testosterone script? Sure. I went to a weekend <laughs> seminar. Uh, it's, it, uh, it, it's pretty infuriating, but also I think the arrogance of the medical community is because I did this studying. Now I'm should be anointed as your fucking man. God. Yeah. It's very, and sometimes the nurses or the nurse practitioners, like, I feel like they actually listen to you, um, more so than the doctors who give you the 10 minutes in the room with you. Um, just because I have had two babies back to back, I went to a new, um, like OB when I was pregnant, um, I had to get parallel care with my midwife and I had an ultrasound and I was waiting to like, you know, the doctor talks to you after the ultrasound to tell you like, yeah, your pregnancy looks good. Or, Hey, we're concerned about whatever. And instead of like even introducing herself to me, she just nailed, like, she was like, I cannot believe you're doing a home birth. You are going to die and your baby's going to die. And that was like her introduction to me. And I was like, (laughs) Okay, I'm gone. <laughs> Bye. Uh, um, like but, yeah, they're arrogant. You you want to hear about a a fucking almost more ridiculous one than that? Because uh, that's fucking awful. Um, was, I left like so upset because she told me, even though you've done it once, that was like a fluke essentially, and now you are risking you and your baby unnecessarily. And she said, "We will never see another mom um, like." open to doing a home birth at our practice. And I was like, but I'm extremely healthy. And, but then she was like, you're very healthy. And so is your baby. And I'm like, and then she told me also don't lift lift anything over 40 pounds. And at that time I'm like, how am I supposed to lift a car seat? Yeah, no, it's so Cashy was, uh, he was born on the 11th and about three weeks later, his belly button got really infected and he actually ended up with staph in his belly button, uh, from Mm -hmm. the hospital. Um, so we had to take him into Chuck and he went through this whole deal and, uh, Kate took him in and I'm with the other two kids. And so Kate calls me hysterical and she's like, Hey, uh, they want to do a, uh, spinal tap on him to check him for meningitis. And I'm like, no, or no. Yeah. What, what do they call it? They, they called it, uh, they, they had some other name for it, but it was basically it was a spinal tap. And so, uh, Kate's like, uh, you know, I'm like right in the middle of this fight. Uh, call my husband. So the doctor calls me and she's like, yeah, we need authorization to do this. And I'm like, no, I'm not going to let you stick a needle in the spine of my fucking three week old baby. Yeah. And so I fucking basically shut it down. I'm like, he doesn't have meningitis. And, and no, I don't authorize this. So I hang up, they call me back and the lady gets on the phone and she's like, can you explain to me why you're going to put your child's life at danger? Yeah, they make- And so I asked the doctor, I'm like, how old are you? She's like uh, 30 years old. I was like, okay, uh, you're 30 years old. Do you have any kids? She's like, no. And I told her, I'm like, basically, you're not going to get a chance to do something that you probably want to put on your fucking resume with my kid. And I was like, when you have some kids and you grow the fuck up, call me back. Up until that point, fuck off. And I hang up on her. And the lady's like, your husband's a, you know, and uh, I'm like, dude, he was fine. He didn't have meningitis. And I'm like, dude, you're going to put my kid through an unnecessary uh, fucking procedure that's extremely dangerous. Because you, I'm like, fuck off. I'm like, no, you don't consent. And, uh, you know, the problem is, is that they uh, have this kind of like holier than now omnipotent attitude where like, you know, this is what I do. And I mean, even to the point when we were dealing with the type one diabetes, I'm in there with the doctors and they're telling me that protein doesn't have an insulogenic effect. So when you're counting carbs and the way they're doing this, I'm like, this is ridiculous. Uh, I've done ton of testing, not only blood, but you know, a blood testing before and after I have an entire journal of this stuff. And you're telling me that a carbs, a carb and protein doesn't have any factor on insulin, uh, production and blood and and blood sugar. And they were like, no. And I was like, have any of you guys ever done any of this training? Have you guys actually ever eaten foods and checked your blood sugar and done this? And and no, not a single one of them had. Yeah. And I'm like, so you guys are going purely off of the American diabetes association, ADA, which if you pull the research, isn't favorable. People that follow that protocol, you know, make it to 50, most of them, 80% ends up, end up with type two diabetes. I mean, it's, it's not a favorable outcome with it. And, uh, I think it's because we're, I mean, yeah, no, it's, uh, you want to get into some weird shit, man, that type one diabetes things for kids that juvenile diabetes is a whole different get ball game and the way that they treat it versus there's, you know, others and the way we're managing with low carb. I mean, cash, hasn't taken insulin in weeks and managing with just a low carb diet you know, based on that Bernstein protocol, which is wild because when we go to his, his, um, his treat or his, uh, doctor's visits, they pull all of his Dexcom scores and the doctor's like, 
before they even ask us what the protocol we're following or what we're doing, the doctor's like, his Dexcom looks amazing. This looks he has the A1C and the blood sugar of, of individual that doesn't have type one diabetes. And then we talked to him and we're like, well, he just eats a low carb diet, he eats high protein. And this is what he's doing. And the doctor's like, even though this isn't the protocol we recommend, we can't argue with the results. And we found one endo that's that believe that the, the other ones are like, if he has carbs, he's not going to grow, he's going to die. And it's, it's fucking unbelievable. But then when you ask him, you're like, isn't diabetes uh, a disease of, car of carbohydrates? I mean, it's the lack of ability to digest, you know, and that's type two, but um, it's uh, extremely frustrating as an adult to go through this. And the problem is a lot of parents don't have resources like I do, or more importantly, access to this information. So they just do what the doctor tells them. And then we were in there last time and a lady came in with a three-year-old who was type one diabetic and she was wheeling the kid mm. in, in a, in a, in a cart because the, the little girl was so fat, she couldn't walk. Mm. And what they're doing is letting the little girl pick what food she wants, which looks like, uh, uh, pancakes, uh, sugary cereals and donuts. And then they're just managing it based off of what she feels comfortable eating. So they're letting a three-year-old select her diet and then just dosing her with insulin to try to balance it out. And then she does this. And this little girl was so fat. Like, I, I, I like, I mean, that's child abuse to me. Yeah. It breaks three, like three-year-olds don't get to pick your, their diet. I don't no. think 18-year-olds get to pick their diet. <laughs> you don't get to pick your diet. <laughs> And if you're our well, clients, you, you see what happens when you set me free inside of Whole Foods. Okay, <laughs> right right there, for the just, fruits. Yeah, you go right for the fruits. Well, what, uh, well let's yep, speak to us yep, about fruit. the fats. We understand cash is on a high protein diet. We'll yep. get into how much shortly, but well, what I mean, about the fat sources that you, you're providing? You got to have fat in the diet because that's what helps with the digestion. Because if you eat a high protein diet in a low fat environment, no carbs, you're going to be real constipated. Mm -hmm. So I know that like... Uh, that's something we have to constantly check on hyper because he's eating like about 125, 150 grams of protein a day. And so I got to make sure to give him fats because fat also slows absorption on the stomach. So he doesn't get as hungry, but also that's what helps number two happen. And we introduce animal fats, coconut, avocado, and olives. Yeah. So we went with saturated fats, uh, both uh, um, animal based and also plant based, but also mono and saturated fats. Uh, I think uh, a lot of the issues that we're seeing in this country are not coming from saturated or monounsaturated are coming from the polysaturated and especially from the seed oils and the seed fats. Can you explain quickly the difference between the omega-3 and the omega-6 plant fat? Uh, no. Okay. Um, not off the top of my head. I would have to go look. All right. That Thanks, was a thanks for throwing me lecture. on the spot here. But there, we, we did have a big piece of lecture. I just can't remember exactly what that piece of the lecture was. We don't if have you to want, have it right now. If you want to throw it out there, if you remember. No. <laughs> No, I, uh, um, I got away a little bit from that omega-3, omega-6 thing. Okay. Um, the reason being is early on, we really talked about like, uh, you know, eating foods, you know, that are uh, heavier in omega-3s. But then the problem was we were wrecking people do nuts and, you know, a handful of walnuts is going to basically smash all your omega-3s. So we talked more about EPA and uh, DHA uh, coming from some something like fish oil or eating some like fatty uh, cold fish you know, uh, fish from cold places. But, you know, at the time people were eating so much meat and they're like, Oh, I'm eating grass fed meat because of the omega threes. And I'm like, no, that, that's not really a thing, even though it sounds good. Uh, it's like, uh, when Tony Gonzalez came with his protein, which was from, uh, grass fed animals, he was talking about the whey protein, having a more favorable amino three profile. But what do we know about whey protein? It's just the protein. There's no fat in there. So where would the omega threes be? So I, I think a lot of that stuff just kind of, kind of thrown by the wayside a little bit where if you get your blood work and you're low in those, but you know, three to five, uh, you know, I take, um, uh, with every meal, I try to take one to through one to two, uh, DHA, EPA, uh, fish oil things or tablets. And I think that usually hits the number pretty well. And then obviously, you know, using, uh, olive oil for that monounsaturated fat being ideal. I mean, there's pretty amazing studies that talk about the countries and the, the groups of people, especially in the Mediterranean that consume higher amounts of olive oil, have a greater sense of wellness and happiness than those that don't. So well, that's because they're living in the Mediterranean. Anyway, the tagline with fats is fat on the plate does not equal fat on the waist. Yep. In speaking to clients, how has this helped direct them to eating and consuming fats for performance or bulking or leaning in their goals? It's 
Yeah, I mean, it's still a tough one because people still have that belief of eating fat. I mean, that's just such a long term thing that people have had, you know, kind of going back to like what John was saying with, um, you know, the Ansel Keys uh, study. 1959, dude. Now we're talking yeah. about like roughly 60 plus years of being fed this narrative, especially in the, um, you know, the food pyramid and with schools, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's still it's still a tough one. So we, you know, we, I personally just kind of tell people to rotate and you know just also um you know being careful right because as we kind of have talked about a drizzle becomes a pour pretty quickly right you don't need as much uh just because it is so calorically dense uh but it's really just kind of you know i think all of this whether it's the protein or the carbohydrates or the fats it's just consistent messaging throughout uh every time we talk to them about stuff like that and eventually you're kind of planting the seed and then watering it every time you talk to them and just keeping them moving in that direction. And then for a lot of people, that's really what it is, is guiding them into the right direction with consistent messaging. So. Nah, oh. that, uh, uh, it, like, it, it's pretty interesting. Um, like I think, and, and this is, uh, uh, like I've seen this with my kids, uh, like regularity with going number, you know, with, uh, with going number two is a huge one. If you're, you know, eating a high protein diet and you find yourself going to the bathroom once every three or four days, that's a huge problem. And then, uh, um, and I know this cause we found out with Cashy, like he didn't go poop for like two or three days. And I was like, I was like, when did you go poop at school? And he's like, nope. I'm like, oh God. So like I made him a shake full of like uh, coconut milk and some like other stuff. And uh, all of a sudden he went in there and went to go do battle and he came out. He was like, Ooh, that was real painful. And uh, he was like, I could see him kind of like sitting down real awkward. And I was like, man, I gotta be a little more on this just because, um, you know, it, like, yeah, like it's, that should be a good indicator. So. Ooh, and how look about at the that? big brain on Sam. And what an interesting <laughs> coincidence that we offer both of these at thorn.com slash you slash power athlete and 20% off. What? That's <laughs> linked dumb. in the show notes. Linked in the show notes. No, uh, I'm, yeah, no, I'm a big fan. And especially in the vitamin D stuff. I mean, uh, anybody that hasn't gone and gotten their vitamin D levels checked, Go make it happen now. Go and get some vitamin D testing. It's super easy. Uh, you know, I, I don't want to get this this podcast slapped with any like anti-COVID stuff. And I'm not saying in any ways, but they know that one of the big determining factors is vitamin D levels in terms of being able to fight off sickness and illness. So that's why all of a sudden winter starts to get hit. Uh, sun, you know, longer nights, shorter days, less sun exposure. Now all of a sudden people tend to get sick. So make sure you're supplementing with vitamin D, but only if you're going and getting tested, because then you have to decide, because here's the deal, you get tested once you supplement with it, you need to go back and see if it actually made a difference. Mm -hmm. And if it, and because we don't want too much vitamin D, just like you don't want too much vitamin A, which text found out by consuming copious amounts of liver. Keto baby. <sighs> yeah. Yeah. Tex was drinking like a 12 pack of Modelo a day <laughs> and eating no. like four loaves of bread and was totally ketogenic because it was just bypassing his Krebs cycle because he was eating so much vitamin A. It's a great way to lose LBs. No, it wasn't. You looked inflamed. You were so puffy. You're like, why is my neck? Like, why would I push into a finger on my neck? Does it stay there like an old woman's fat legs? Gross. 
Uh, next, <laughs> do you got any more awkward transitions, there, Caitlin? Well, I'm going to limit your uh, ribbing on me, John. Just like our limit list of nuts, seeds, and fruits. Why would you recommend only limiting these to one to two <sighs> servings per client? Uh, it, it says limit, not avoid, because what I found, and you guys will find this too, and I'm sure you, you will chime in and agree when you look at people's food logs, the easiest kind of fat and carb sources are to grab fruit, nuts, and seeds. And in Glassman's original thing where it's like eat meat, nuts, seeds, fruits. I mean, it was, it was right in Glassman's hundred words of fitness, but I got tired of looking at these, uh, you know, food logs when people would break it down, everybody was using some form of uh, nut and seed for their fats and everybody was eating fruit for their carbohydrates. And so I don't mind like a piece of fruit and like maybe a, a little nut butter or a handful of here and there, but you have to eat with diversity and just going to the fruit every time is not beneficial. So that's why I got limit, not avoid. Yeah. Uh, I was like Paul Carter's, uh, nobody got sent to fat or so nobody ever got kicked out of fat camp for eating too many vegetables. I thought that was like, uh, I mean, it's probably the only intelligent thing Paul Carter's ever said. That was a joke. He said a lot of intelligent things, but, uh, I, I did really like that one was good. I was like, Hey, nobody got kicked out of fat camp for eating too many vegetables. So that was interesting when talking with people and they were like, oh, well, how many, you know, uh, you know, it, it's okay that I ate a little bit more. I'm like, you can overeat your vegetables just like you can overeat your protein. And, uh, you know, yeah. Well, but but there's also Half fiber. Time. Mom there, was right. There's also, oh yeah, no, hundred percent. We hit it up. Uh, but there's also fiber in there. So, I mean, there's, there, there's a lot more than just fructose and the age old one I used to put up was, a, you know, fruit is not just fructose. There's other things in fruit, uh, like the, uh, like the white stuff, like when you go peel an orange, that white stuff, uh, for an orange and for a grapefruit is, is an incredible antiviral. So, uh, like that was one I remember Inkledon told me years ago and he's like, Hey, if you're going to eat fruit or, or grapefruit, like make sure you're trying to get as much of like the, the white stuff, like the connective between the skin and the, and the fruit, try to get as much of that as consumed as possible. Cause that's got a real great antiviral profile. So I was like, easy enough. You didn't know that did you Tex? I didn't. I haven't been sick in like four years, but you, you haven't been sick four cuties a day. <laughs> I'm so, I've never taken a sick tech. I'm like that. Uh, Bruce Willis in that. You've M. Night never Shadowland taken movie. A, sick day, a sick day? No. Check the record. Uh, you've taken emotional sick days. <laughs> well, from all your ribbings. Oh. <laughs> well, oh, so I didn't know we were, uh, uh, you know, Luke, Luke leaves and now we're in a kind and gentle office. Uh, yeah. I took a David Carr mental health day. Yeah. Um, well, I'm going to avoid any awkward transition, just like our long avoid list, John, which includes grains. Uh, pseudo grains, legumes, soy, corn, veggie, nut, and seed oils. I feel yeah. like you were ahead of the curve with those. Yeah, the uh, man, like um, I've walked back a little bit of that stuff. Uh, I do think that the, maybe there's a little bit of benefit to consuming like some black beans and throwing some legumes in on occasion. Uh, I think, uh, but I would not want to consume those on a daily basis just because that carbohydrate spike, uh, carbohydrate based lectin makes very similar to gluten within the gut. Um, I haven't found a performance benefit for consuming gluten. I think there's other carb sources and there really isn't. It's a plant-based protein and doesn't necessarily aid us in any performance way. Now, if you don't react to it and you want to consume it, that's fine. Um, but I think even on like, even the people that don't react, I believe there's always some low level inflammation. Um, I've just, uh, I've never just found a performance benefit to, you know, eating a ton of gluten and there's a lot of gluten-free options now if you want to consume some stuff. 
Uh, I remember my mom used to constantly ask me about quinoa. It's another complete protein. So that's why I threw in the, uh, the pseudo greens, which are um, from flat, I think it's flat leaves. Um, you know, if you don't react to this stuff, then it's not a big issue, but we found a large amount of people were reacting to this stuff. So that's where I got in. And then I, I, I walked back. I used to have oats in there and I used to have rice. Oh, we'll get there. I walked back on those because I never found a person that, well, actually it's not true. I found one person who had some form of allergic reaction to rice where they would have white rice and they were getting a ton of bloat in their stomach. I mean, white rice is pure glucose. So, I mean, what, what else was going on? They couldn't digest it. It's like, uh, you know, meeting people that do the carnivore diet because they're so metabolically broken that the only thing they can consume is one, you know, one form of food. So, I mean, the definition of metabolic flexibility is you can consume the most amount of foods and be healthy. So, yeah, I walked back the white rice and then I also walked back on the oats because they have really bitching gluten-free oats. So we didn't necessarily have any problems with oats. Those were categorized as up to use. Yep. Yep. So those are purely based on whether or not you can tolerate them. So I walk back on those. Final piece, dairy, fresh versus fermented. Mm -hmm. uh, every hunter gatherer tribe uh, that would that uh, Ansel Keys or not Ansel Keys, um, Western Price looked at consume some form. Well, not everyone, but a, a good portion of them consume some form of fermented dairy. I think the only ones might have been the Anute, but they consumed a diet purely of like seal and whale meat and like seal blubber. Just they just didn't have access to it. Uh, but like the Maasai warrior and there were just others that can had some form of fermented dairy in the system and uh, they were all pretty healthy. So there's a distinction between fermented, which would be like Greek yogurt and cheese. Uh, what, what's cool about the fermentation process is it blunts the lactose and you can get much lower lactose and still keep the protein in the system. Fresh dairy, uh, you know, I mean, I, I really think, uh, and uh, like just kind of personally feel like even though we have the ability to digest dairy after weaning, which is a kind of a genetic abnormality, um, you know, there's a lot of people that don't have that gene, but if you're from a Northern white kind of background, you have that gene to digest dairy after weaning. I think um, it's not necessarily a problem. I just wouldn't go and drink a gallon of milk as a 40 year old. So like I'll put a little like, uh, you know, whole cream or a little bit of something in coffee on occasion, or maybe, you know, I don't know, maybe a little bit of ice cream on occasion, but like the days of me sitting down and having four and five, six glasses of whole milk, uh, I'm not doing that at my age. Now for my kids, not necessarily as much of a problem, uh, but I, I leave it up to them. Do you guys want me to buy milk? No, sometimes they're like, yes. And we've kind of gone back and forth and, you know, uh, it's, I think it's dependent, but I, like, I don't think as an adult, a 40 plus year old adult that, um, I, if I sat down and was drinking a gallon of milk a day would necessarily benefit me in any way. I mean, it's, a, it's there, there's other ways for me to get those, uh, macronutrients more so than consuming milk. What's Icelandic yogurt? It's made with real little bits, Icelandic people. Uh. Well, big, it's big it's, guy. it's fermented. I mean, ah. so it's, I mean, uh, yeah, it's like Greek yogurt is just fermented yogurt, but I mean, there is different, like, and there's a couple of different ones. I just love the tangy taste. Like it's got that little bit of tang to it. Oh, it's so good. I'm a big fan of it. Yeah. Hmm. Sounds good. That's that's well, actually the kids will eat whatever you like. That's what we figured out. Like if we're like, mm, they're like, mm. it's great. Except, Cauliflower lice. Right. Yeah, yeah lice. Lice. Mm. Well, it's not a bad one. It does kind of look like lice. <laughs> uh, yeah. She's bigger. That's what I'll tell Jamie she's eating. Got you back. Uh, uh, no, uh, she'll talk shit to you and be like, whatever, Texas Daisy. And you're like, God damn it. You're like, I can't wait till you're old enough for having me punch you in the stomach. <laughs> Sit in your corner. Uh, well, we've covered what to eat. Now let's take a brief moment and talk about when. 
food mm. timing. Remember when this was a big deal? Uh, yeah, I, I think um, when we when I originally wrote this, I had a much bigger appreciation for for uh, for nutrient timing. And I think now I've got the, uh, you know, we had, um, God, who, who did we have on? Oh, I know. I know exactly what it looks like. But do you remember who was the guy we had on that talked about Keith Barr, uh, Keith Barr that talked about uh, protein synthesis uh-huh. and more importantly, like the, the anabolic window needed for protein. So there was this idea that, you know, like you hear bros being like, dude, if you don't consume, uh, you know, X amount of protein within 30 minutes post training, you're going to miss your anabolic window. And uh, Keith Barr came on and they did research where they found that that anabolic window is directly dependent to age and training, uh, experience. So for like a young, healthy individual, that anabolic window could be up to 48 hours, uh, for a, uh, and the people they did the, the research on were like 60 and 70 year old people, old people that were trying to fight up sarcopenia. They had an anabolic window of like, I think he what, it was like one to two hours. So at the time, the research that people were extrapolating. And it wasn't until he uh, told us about the study and then, and then sent the link over. And then I went and I read it, uh, you know, it's uh, like the study was all done on old people. So yeah, the anabolic window was very, very prevalent. So we made that recommendation, like, um, you know, ideally, you know, you want to eat something in that pre-workout window, you want to train, if you want to include something in that kind of peri inter workout window, and then immediately post, I think uh, I've walked back a little bit on that one where now it's like, as long as you're eating a high protein meal somewhere after that training, it doesn't have to be like, let me race home and slam a protein shake. Uh, but as long as I'm eating a high protein meal within, you know, a couple hours of that training session, I'm usually fine. But if you're trying to match your macros and you know, Hey, I got to eat 3000 calories today, which looks like, you know, five, 600 calorie meals or, you know, uh, you know, uh, two 1000 meals and two 500s, I'm going to need to space those accordingly. So I'm more consumed concerned with, can you get your training done and can you consume your daily macros within the given amount of time? So that's where I kind of walked it back a little bit. We're going to close with macros, John. Next up, how much let's start with protein. How much protein are we encouraging people to consume? Uh, I'll kick it to you guys seeing as I've been talking way too much. <laughs> what one group? One one gram uh, per pound is what we typically recommend, and for is some that people, goal body weight, Rob, or current body weight. I I usually use current body weight depending on what what someone's doing. So that question to me is like, hey, if I'm following Jack Street and I'm doing dumbbell bench, do I put down <laughs> a combination? Do I add the dumbbells together, or do I just list the one dumbbell? That's like a similar question. I. I pose that question is because I've received that question in a nutrition lecture and I want to make sure about adding up dumbbells, uh, no, about how much protein consume. If I want to gain 15 pounds, I'm not consuming that plus 15. My favorite was always like, well, you know, is it a total body or is it total body weight or is it lean body mass? And my first question to them is what's your lean body mass? And they go, I don't know. I'm like, then why the fuck would you ask this question? Yeah. Like I uh, like like ew. like uh, the the amount of people that would throw that out and my and I'm always my responsible. What's your lean body mass? I don't know. I've never got my body fat done. Well, then how the fucking like what are we supposed to use a uh, uh, you know a, a Ouija board to contract your ancestors to figure this shit out? No, just go off of what your fucking scale weight is. Exactly. Like, don't add up the fucking dumbbells. If I say to you, hey, what'd you hit on dumbbell bench? You said, I want to hit the hundreds. And I go, great, go grab the hundreds. You're like, no, I just did 50. I added them up. You know what happens? You're going to get Sparta kicked in the chest out of the gym. <laughs> I know. Yeah. This is Sparta. Uh, crossover step ups. <laughs> well, seeing as it weighs way more than her. So I'm like, uh, you need to gain weight, skinny. <laughs> No, she's shredded. I, uh, it's, it's fucking impressive. And then the funny part is, is like the amount of people and I, I, dude, I still laugh. Like I'm like, she's, uh, uh, in such good shape and these women are constantly fucking on her. And she's even like, we have a gym. You should come train with me. I have a training group. And like, she still can't get these women over. And, uh, and then the funny part is she'll train with them and they see what she's doing. And they're like, I'll never be able to do that. She's like, well, yeah, not coming once a month. 
like it's it's so weird that like there's this like lens of like hey here's the opportunity this is what i do you can come do it too all you have to do is this and they just like put up all these barriers and blocks and why they can't do it it's it's really just like she she comes home and it's like i just can't figure it out i'm like welcome to the job of uh of everything we do i'm like wait you know on the nutrition side on the training side uh it's just it's amazing yeah Easy, Sam. We'll get we'll get there. Yeah, let's get there on the last one. Well, we need to cover quickly. Roy G. Biv. Uh, yeah, Roy G. Biv. Red, yellow, indigo, blue, and violet. So it's the colors of the rainbow. And what else is it in terms of uh, guidelines and nutrition? Yeah. Sweet. Yeah, I think the the greens. The, I think it's interesting that the greens are such a big thing because I think that's the easiest thing for people to get. Like, I, I think people really struggle with the other colors. Greens, like the easy one, like like you were saying earlier, John. So, so I, athletic greens because the greens the easiest to get. Actually, the athletic greens is by far the most overly redundant deal. Right. Well, yeah. Our company, Athletic Violets, is it's going to crush it. Uh, I thought it was <laughs> Athletic Eggplants. Athletic it, indigos, uh, yeah, it's Indig just indigos. It's just a whole Indigo, bunch of eggplant right? uh, emojis, yeah. Which is weird because Charles sends me those all the time. I just didn't thought he was looking for athletic greens. Hmm. Good. Well, okay. I don't want to give it all away, but we got to conclude with macros. No, we're not talking about macros. I'm what do you mean? Of, I'm tired of talking on, about bro. macros. No, it, it's well, like, I'm going to eat whatever fits. Uh, I think if you are consuming a high protein diet and at least one gram of protein per pound of body weight, and then you're bound, you're backfilling with carbohydrates and fat based upon taste. I think we can save macros for another day because I feel like macros has been absolutely curb stomped on the internet within the last, I mean, everybody's got this like this secret macronutrient ratio and this. And uh, the one thing I did appreciate about Stan Efferding's uh, vertical diet when he was on the podcast, he didn't talk about macros. He talked about micronutrients and eating for micronutrients. And like, it was, uh, it was such a fresh breath of air. And we do talk about macros because people unfortunately need landmarks, but at the end of the day, uh, if you're eating a high protein diet and then you're kind of balancing with between the carbohydrates and fat, and that's where we start to kind of get into this. And that's where I think of the nutrition ninjas are so beneficial. I think that's really based on the individual. More importantly, if they're trying to lose weight, gain weight, and how we're kind of skidding back into it. So let's not talk about macros. Episode 286 with Stan Efferding. Let's get into Let's don't get weird. Okay. The final note, the mystery in which you have this big blank space on the board. And you finally get there, and then you just bring it all home, John. Don't be laying weird. this plan. Plan. Yeah. So, so the don't be weird thing uh, came from we taught a seminar at Balboa years ago. So CrossFit football at CrossFit Balboa, which was our home gym. And I remember this dude walks in, and he's like, no shoes. I think he might have been wearing like a a, a fur loincloth, um, ill-fitting kind of weirdly cut up tank top. I think he had a coonskid hat. And he had like a, like a bag that was made from like a stomach of an animal. And I saw this dude come in he smelled poorly. And, uh, we get into this thing and he's like, you know, taking all these notes, he gets underneath, we go start lifting weights. He can't do dead bugs. He can't do any of the warm ups. We get underneath the bar to start barbell back squatting. He's like the dog shitting a razor blade at 135, And like by far the lowest performer we had ever had at that point to a, a, a CrossFit football seminar. 
The only lower performing individual we had at that was Lauren Glassman. Greg's wife, the inventor of CrossFit, Lauren was like, hadn't ever lifted weights, which is weird. Uh, but uh, this guy was just, he couldn't do anything. He was out of breath. He was tired. He was inflamed, just had a lot of problems. So uh, we get into this thing, we get into the nutrition talk and he like has a million questions. So finally I was like, yo man, okay. Uh, he was asking about, uh, he didn't believe that you should cook your food. He thought that like the greatest form of, uh, you know, uh, getting back to your roots. I mean, Primal was eating all your food raw. So he was a, a raw food eater. And uh, I asked him, I was like, hey man, like I believe that as animals, some point, you know, we ate all of our food in a raw state. But I think the first time we came across like a big forest fire that, uh, that encompassed animals and we scavenged and found cooked meat, we never ate raw meat again. The minute that something got cooked, I think we, the, the bioavailability increased or, or got digested it bigger, uh, because of the digestion, we didn't have as many gut problems. So now all of a sudden there was more resource to go to the brain, the brain grew. And, uh, I was like, dude, I, I really think there was a point in our evolutionary history where there was a deviation you know, we talk about like the bipedals Andy and already standing up, um, you know, and then I think the other deviation was when the, when they, you know, found fire and they started cooking meat. I think that was where we all of a sudden just separated. And, uh, he was like, no, no, no. And so he gives me his diet, which kind of makes me want to throw up a little bit listening to it, but he used to drink this thing that he called his elixir, which was like a dozen raw eggs, raw cream, and then raw chocolate. And then he would shake it up and drink it. And he had this thing in like a Mason jar and he was like sipping his elixir as he called it. And I told him like, first of all, that smells fucking awful. Um, the smell from you, like your body is absolutely horrendous. You're by far the lowest performer, weakest individual we've had. And the inflammation within your face and your hands and your legs, like to the point where like, if you were to take your finger and press it into his leg, you would probably see that finger mark for like days. So the dudes, like the infl you could just see the inflammation in his body everywhere was inflamed. I mean, by far the weakest, zero capacity, no ability to do anything, and just the lowest level performer we'd ever had. And dude, just the smell. And I told him, I was like, hey, man, if like you think that by some means that your performance here has been fucking incredible, that you've crushed this thing. And, uh, you know, the smell coming off you is any indicator. And more importantly, I can just see the inflammation in your body. If you think that this is healthy, I think you should pivot 180. And I think you should get away from this as soon as possible. So unfortunately, he was so locked in on like his image and the whole deal that he couldn't pivot. And instantly, I didn't know what the fuck I was talking about. Even though, I mean, dude, we had women out there that were literally fucking like you know, had just been training for a few months that were dramatically stronger, pulled more weight, squatted more weight, bench more weight, did everything. And not that women are weaker, but like as a dude who can, who, who trains and is into this lifestyle, the guy was so far from what I would deem as healthy. And so that's what coined the whole, like, don't be weird. If you find yourself getting into a weird place where you're counting almonds and drinking weird elixirs and doing things, you've gone too far and you need to come back from the, from the edge. And, uh, we would periodically run into people that had gone too far that all of a sudden had gotten to this weird place where all of a sudden, like we had to like pull them back from the, from the flame, pull them back from the edge. And, uh, that moment was where I added in the, don't be weird into the nutrition lecture. I always wonder what happened to that stinky little guy. If you're out there, he's probably listening to me. Let us know. Son of a bitch. Well, if he's listening, then maybe like, he's changed. Like when, when he cracked that uh, mason jar full of his elixir, the smell was like, like literally cleared out the room to where people were like, oh God, you know, like what was it where, um, you remember where it's a sex panther and she's yeah. like, it smells like gasoline. It's like a uh, baby diaper. Covered yeah. in Indian he's like, food. Ooh, that's potent. Same shit. Like I was like, do, do you call it sex panther? So yeah, that was wild. Yep. And uh, that was how I don't be weird. I was like, and stop wearing a loincloth. Nobody wants to see you wear a long loincloth. <laughs> Carrying your shit in a satchel. Oh, yeah, dude. He was a strange dude. Like, you know, oh, you know, connect. I mean, I, I did appreciate the barefoot, like connected to the ground, but like the idea, like in the raw, the, the raw meat, raw food, everything raw is just so weird. I mean, I appreciate raw meat. I'm sure you guys like, um, what's it called? Um, 
tartare? Yes, like steak tartare. I dig steak tartare where they put like the little robin egg or like the, little, the small little egg and the mustard on like some like uh, a toast. I'm a, a huge fan, but I'm really looking forward to the cooked steak that comes after that. You know, and I I, I do like it black and blue. I like a um, uh, a fillet where it's just like crusted on the outside and it's raw in the middle, but not every time. Like it's just. I can't imagine eating raw meat at every point. There's no way. Oh, well, that's raw fish. That's a little bit different. I'm a huge fan of raw fish. But yeah, raw meat. So at the end of the day, all this stuff is great information. But if you feel yourself getting into a weird place where you're wearing a loincloth and doing strange shit, just fucking reach out, reach out to Sam and Rob, reach out to our nutrition at powerathletehq.com and we will help you to not be weird and to get you on track. It's not your fault. That was my other one, but that was actually the, uh, in the training thing with, um, remember we talked about the, like the training program that a lot of times like the goodwill hunting when he goes to, uh, what was it? It was Robin Williams to, uh, Matt Damon. It's not your fault. Will. like a lot of times when we work not with people, you, Sean. Yeah. <laughs> not you, man. And he's like, yeah, it's not your fault. But I think uh, nutrition is one of those really interesting things that you sometimes, many times, you need somebody to help you navigate, or more so just having somebody as a sounding board who's not you in your head that, hey, does this sound like a good idea? Or what do you think about this? Nope. Stay to the plan. Stay consistent. And I think what you guys do a great job on is just reassuring the people, hey, we need to make a tweak. No, no, no. Let's continue to go this way. We'll see how it goes. And just trying to make the small modifications so people can uh, reach your goals. And, uh, you know, I do love when we get before and after pictures. I wish we got way more of them, but I'm always stoked when we see them and we're making good progress. Can, can, can we post these on the, on the Instagram? They're like, no, you're like, fuck, I'll have a black out your face. That's what we need. Eggplant over the face. <laughs> mm. No, no, Texas is so hungry. It is, it is lunchtime. It is lunchtime. I, to close out, I cannot emphasize how awesome it was to uh, be a part of a seminar that involved John because he would take the nutrition lecture away from me, <laughs> thank God. And you had to leave at least three hours for him to essentially walk through the, the, the podcast discussion we had today, plus some form of conspiracy theory that involved uh, California water, almonds, almonds Hillary aliens, Clinton. hill dog. Yeah. So uh, what would be funny is, is I, when I went to the seminars, they wouldn't let me teach anything because <laughs> I used to fuck it all up because they, you know, like it, it was all like a well-oiled machine. And all I did was I just threw a monkey wrench in it. So like they got to the point where they were like, hey, uh, what we've done is we've effectively like backfilled and got everything done. So then we're going to push nutrition to after lunch and we'll give you like a huge window where we got some other shit we can cut out. And I would get up there having not had to speak for two days and being like, I've just been you know reading and like, here's some new information. We're going to talk about time travel. We're going to talk about the efficiency of getting to Mars and whatever I was reading, I would incorporate into the nutrition so much. So we had uh, Eric... Eric Preston from, from Eric Cross CrossFit. Yeah. yeah. Eric Preston from CrossFit HQ was like, I have never in all my years met anybody go farther off the rails and then pull it back within a few minutes. Like you did. He's like, it was unfucking believable for three hours. I had no idea. And then you tied it all up with a bow. He's like, it was impressive. I was like, thank you. <laughs> if this podcast, good thing we have this podcast because we don't teach seminars anymore. I don't, I'd be probably, I'd probably be divorced by then. My wife would be like, shut up. Stop talking to the kids. I was just checking in on Eric. We got I'm going to make him my LinkedIn friend. Uh, we should get him on the podcast. Well, let's catch up first. I know yeah. he's a big biker guy. Oh, uh, biker. biker. Uh, I'm an idiot. Yeah, I'm an idiot. All right. Well, that's it. He only has, oh, shit. He hasn't got one connection on LinkedIn. It's about to be two. All right, Nutrition Ninjas, thank you for joining us. Another, for another episode of Power, Power Athlete, Athlete Radio. Radio. Bye. Bye. <laughs>